This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewer's natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. Hey, this is J.D. Webb from The Meat House. Usually after the show, the guys and I hang out and talk about various things. So we figured, why not record it and add it in as a bonus track? So as we get ready to fire up the mics here tonight, sit back and enjoy about 15 minutes of The After Show. We'll see you here in a little bit. And I don't like dry meat. So the only way to solve that problem is to make something that I do like sweet, which is I like sweet mocha. Yeah. So okay, that's my take on it. But Makes we've sense. got to nail down. We've got to nail down the perfect coffee mead first. Yeah. Well, and then the best way to, to yeah, infuse that coffee. Yeah. Now, how would you? I mean, with a coffee mocha, what would you? How would you work the chocolate in? Is that steeped along with the cold brew or do you put that no, I'd probably just put the, the the coffee the crushed nibs in primary uh, so you're talking you're talking using the cocoa nibs I, I would either use the nibs or I would use that Dutch uh, see now I, I use the Dutch powder yeah. uh, in this orange chocolate uh, I heard a lot of good things about the Dutch cocoa so that's how I went with that. Yeah. Um, and it smells great. You know those chocolate oranges that you buy at Christmas time? Mm-hmm. My wife uh, came home with a bag of them from this winery that there's a little chocolate shop there. So, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Well, this thing smells exactly like that. It smells great, but it looks like goat vomit. <laughs> it, it's awful looking. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh my God. Wow. Uh, so, <laughs> I, I don't know what it's going to look like once it clears. I'm hoping, I'm, I'm hoping for something pleasant looking. Uh, if not, we may have to break out the food coloring or something. <laughs> Put it through one of those wine filter deals or something. <laughs> yeah. Haven't you got uh, kind I, of a. Don't don't you use some kind of a filter at in in surgery that you put blood through that takes all the shit out of it? Oh well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can get a dialysis filter, but uh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> to take your car boy to work with you, and, yeah, just set it up next to a dialysis machine. And, yeah, I mean, I I can get a dialysis filter and a point four or five micron sterile filter. And hook them up in line and make it water white, but <laughs> it'd probably strip all the flavor out too. <laughs> well, uh, I, uh, well, yeah, coffee. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess that sounds like. Like I said, I, I'm not a, I'm not a. Um, I don't mind having a little piece of a chocolate with, you know, with a nice cup of coffee. Uh, you know, my wife loves chocolate cake and we've had, you know, chocolate cake with a cup of coffee, but the two together in the same cup, I, I just, I don't do the, you know. Well, I remember Eric Newquist saying that, that he tried some chocolate with his coffee mead and, uh, it turned out pretty funky. Yeah. So we need to talk to him first before we jump into the chocolate thing and, uh, find out what went wrong and, and and go from there, but I, I, let's let's nail down this coffee first. Yeah. And uh, yeah. What do you, uh, Jeff and Aaron? What are you guys thinking uh, as far as this coffee thing? How, how, how would you approach it differently than what Chris and I are doing? Well, you know, go ahead, go ahead, Jeff. Oh, um, you know my my thoughts are that. Yeah, to, to cut down on the bitterness and the acidity, you do want to do a cold brew. That's just, it seems like a, a kind of a basic thing to me. 
Um, if I were going to do something different, I might be tempted to try um, some different adjuncts. Uh, for uh, a little while last year, I was considering doing a, uh, a kind of like a vanilla hazelnut um, coffee heat. Um, mm-hmm. just because, yeah, those are, those are two flavors that go nicely with a mead and I could see that being winding up sweet and still tasting kind of nice. Um, the other, there's a guy on YouTube that made a coffee wine and he used a hazelnut coffee in the coffee wine. Interesting. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. Um, actually I had a, uh, a coffee mead, um, when I was at my, the, the, uh, mead judge exam, it was made in some meadery in Baltimore, but they called it a breakfast mead because it was coffee and blackberries and oh. those two flavors. Yeah. Actually like play really nice together. I was surprised at how well that actually worked out. Coffee. Hmm. Mm. Not my, you know, I, I, I would even, I, I might even, cons- I would probably consider that before I would do the chocolate. That would be my own preference, but, uh, but. And really thinking about the chocolate edition too. Um, if I wanted to do something really interesting with a, a coffee and chocolate, um, one thing that immediately springs to mind is the way the, the ancient Aztecs used to drink their coffee with a little bit of cayenne pepper. Cayenne. Oh. Yeah, they did the uh, their hot chocolate that way also. Yeah. Oh, the hot uh, chocolate is what I meant. Yes. Hell, uh, not the coffee. Still drink, Mexicans still drink their chocolate. Uh huh. And uh, just just a little bit of a taste of it, enough to kind of give you that the sensation of the the heat and a little bit of that kind of flavor, yeah. uh, but have a really strong um, chocolate and probably coffee as well um, leg to stand on. That actually sounds pretty tasty to me. Interesting. That does sound good. I. So I I did a cayenne pepper capsicumel, if I'm saying that correctly, um, about a year ago, and it's really good. Um, you know, it, it used clover honey and then just some a couple of cayenne peppers from our garden, and it's you know it's just one of those things that you can do to kind of balance out the sweet with a little bit of heat like that, and and. Um, I could see with the coffee flavor or chocolate that would play real nicely. Sergio uh, Sergio Mutella at um, Melovino makes a I think it's called Papino mead. It's made with jalapenos. It's actually kind of nice. Uh, you know, uh, the heat comes right at the tail end. You get this little bite, this little sting. This little yeah, it's afterwards the after flavor. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to do something like that with a uh, with a pepper and black currant. Uh, I was thinking about something, what, calling it like in the heat of the night or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah not not burn your face off hot, but just a hint. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a, a uh, there's a meter out in Kent, not the. Uh, near Springfield, uh, if I'm not mistaken, kind of over by me. And uh, I, I got to taste one of their meads they did last summer, which was uh, uh, jalapeno and pineapple. And it had a really strong God, yeah. pineapple presence that the jalapeno was just kind of like sneaky there at the end. And it kind of finished everything off with just a little bit of a tail burn. It was really subtle but really pleasant. So, See, and that's how I like – I mean, my, my wife is an absolute – Fanatic. I mean, she she loves pepper. She loves jalapenos, ghost pepper. She eats them all. She loves all these different kind of, of, of Tabasco sauces and all these different flavored stuff. Uh, and I think, I think we'd get along real well. I, I'm a real <laughs> yeah. big hot sauce, spicy fanatic. Oh God, yes. And I mean, just everything she eats. And uh, I keep, you know, we go to a restaurant, I mean, order a nice uh, meal. The first thing that goes on, I put salt and pepper. She puts Tabasco sauce. <laughs> I keep telling her, you know, I'm going to get up and go in the kitchen and tell the chef on you. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, the thing that I don't like about a lot of these things that she likes is that the heat is like way up front. It's like immediate. It's like, bam, you know. 
it starts burning a hole through your tongue, and then you taste all the rest of the stuff. I don't like that. I, I like to taste the the ingredients and then get the heat at the end. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bee nectar. Bee, bee nectar makes one. I think it's called Devil Juice, and it's it's also pineapple and. Um, I'm not sure if it's jalapeno or it may be chipotle. I'm not sure. They make all, a cherry chipotle also. All a chipotle. Fire roasted jalapeno. Yeah, it's a smoked dried yeah. jalapeno. Right. Um, but from what I understand, the, the smoking helps to reduce some of the heat. Well, yeah, a lot of that heat's coming from the seeds and from the membrane uh, inside. If you take a jalapeno, split it open, carve out the seeds, and then peel the membrane ribs off, you just wind you wind up with a a you get that jalapeno flavor, but without the heat. Right. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, the capsaicin is kind of an oily. Uh, yeah. Um, substance. So anything that would kind of take down the oil or um, yeah. neutralize it in some way would probably help too, like smoking. Yeah. Um, that's, why, that's why if you're working with jalapenos, you never want to rub your face with your hand because you'll never get that <laughs> sting out. It'll be. See, I, I learned. Mm-hmm. I learned that if you're going to make chipotles, you've got to do them on their own by themselves yeah. because the last time I smoked uh, some pork on the uh, on my smoker I was going to put some jalapenos on there to dry and make chipotle and uh, the the grease from the pork <laughs> got all over them and they just got soggy and greasy oh. <laughs> and so I had, oh, no. barbecued, I had barbecued jalapenos instead of chipotles so, uh, oh. so uh, which is actually pretty good, but not what I was shooting for. Did um, did the jalapenos impart any spiciness to the pork then too, or just the other way around? Yeah, it was the other way around. Uh, yeah, I kind of laid them off to the side so that they didn't get uh, a lot of heat. They just mostly got smoke and and would dry. Uh, I put like a, a little slit in them with a knife so that they would dry. And but I, I forgot about the you know the smoke's going to have grease from the pork in it, and so they just got greasy. They didn't dry at all. Gotcha. Uh, I have. So if you're going if you're going to make chipotles, do them by themselves. Yeah. I have my pineapple. Uh, I've got a pineapple infused tequila going that I started about a month ago, uh, and it's in uh, a half gallon jar and a one quart jar, and I'm thinking of dropping uh, about half or maybe even a quarter of a chopped up jalapeno in the small jar just to see uh, what would happen. So I, I, I might try that, but that's go the- for it. Yeah. <laughs> Be good. That's another. That's another web favorite. JD's JD's pineapple tequila that doesn't stay in the house very long. Everybody, everybody loves it. So I usually wind up with the little jar. The wife keeps giving away the big jars. So. <laughs> well, guys, I'm going to get off here. We'll uh, JD. We'll collaborate sometime uh, yeah. in the coming week on this coffee thing and. Uh, yeah. Uh, get everything to, to Aaron and Jeff and let them formulate their game plan, and then we'll just all start at once if you want. Just yeah, and I think it would be, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fun thing to do on a show, just, uh, you know, like we're doing with everything else, just kind of keep up with the notes and you know, spend a little bit of time talking about it. And uh, I think we had a pretty cool show tonight, guys. So. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, absolutely. Good doing the show. Yep. All right. Next week. Yep. I, yeah. And I, I am just, I'm so freaking tired. I mean, vacation is so much work. I mean, believe me. Uh, I'm really tired. So, uh, yep. 
we'll talk to everybody next week. Sounds like a plan. Yeah, have a good week, guys. Talk to you then. This is J.D. Webb for the Meat House Radio Show. Join myself, Chris Spencer, Aaron Martin, and Jeff Schaus each Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for 90 minutes of Mead Talk. If you're a home mead maker, this is the show for you. We discuss fermenting methods, equipment, even a few do-it-yourself projects to make brewing easier at home. You can even call the show and tell us what you've got in the hopper. The Mead House, a show by mead makers for mead makers. Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, right here at themeadhouse.com. Be sure and download our exclusive app for both iOS and Android and take the show with you. Themeadhouse.com. And now live from the Mead House, here are J.D. Webb, Mississippi Chris Spencer, Aaron Martin, and Jeff Schaus. Well, and here we are again on a Tuesday night, and uh, just uh, kind of a pre-show uh, yakking here. Uh, told all the boys, uh, we kind of put in a little bit of an extra bonus track here tonight. Uh, we just got through listening to about 15 minutes out of an after show that we put together out of, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. We were ta- We just started talking about the coffee thing uh, and various things. Uh and I uh, thought it might be fun to uh, throw something out there, but, uh, you know, from the after show. Uh, again, this is the Mead House. It's Tuesday night. Uh, we got a full house tonight. Aaron Martin with us. Mississippi Chris Spencer. Jeff Schaus, of course. My name is J.D. Webb. Uh, you know, if you're into making mead, good mead at home, this is the show you need to be listening to because we're going to throw the honey out for you before you make any mistakes at home. We'll do it for you first. And if you have any questions about it, hey, feel free to give us a holler. Call us anyway. Uh, we do have a phone number, 818-921-4680. And we even have a web uh, a website, uh, themeadhouse.com, and the Facebook deal, uh, just simply The Mead House. And sorry, we just don't do the Twitter thing. So, <laughs> um with that being said, uh, first, uh, you know, usually you try to get out a couple of shout outs. I got two tonight. Uh, one, and I, and I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to totally bastardize this guy's last name because I have no idea how to, how to say it, but I'm going to give it a shot. And I apologize. That's our disclaimer. Uh, Dick Ferreria is uh, what I'm guessing his last name is. Anyway, caught an article or a, a post of his. In the wine and mead making enthusiast Facebook group, uh, he just recently tasted mead for the first time. Uh, apparently, it was a Chaucer's mead. wasn't real thrilled about how it tasted. Said it had a very strong honey smell uh, and taste. Uh, it was very sweet and a strange aftertaste. Uh, he said also that he later had to mix it with some wine. I guess to to uh, kind of knock it down a bit. Uh, a lot of people responded back, and uh, I gave him a couple of suggestions, uh, Chris and uh, Aaron and, and uh, Jeff. Uh, a couple that I came up with was Moonlight, uh, Redstone Meadery. There's a couple others out there that, uh, that you're familiar with? Rabbit's Foot. Rabbit's Foot. That's the one. And, and Shrams, of course. Around me, yeah. So uh, and uh, Melovino, yeah, Melovino, absolutely, yeah. So you could throw out bee nectar if you're a little bit on the experimental side. I mean, they yeah. got some very different stuff. Very good. Yeah. yeah so entirely, uh, di- entirely different style from bee nectar. Absolutely. Uh, so, Dick, if you're listening, uh, there's a there's a few uh, others that you might try out there. And then if you keep listening to the show, you can start making this stuff at home and uh, make it to your own liking. And that's why we enjoy it so much here at the Mead House. Scott Scher, uh, this is from the Mead Makers Facebook group. He says for the past several years, he's named his – now this is I, – I, I was thinking of Chris when I, when I found this. Uh, says that he's been uh, naming his mead after Cowboy Junkies songs. 
Uh, I don't know who the cowboy junkies are, but <laughs> uh, it says that uh, tonight, uh, after maybe too many glasses of a newly tapped orange blossom traditional, it occurred to me why I always loved the junkies for their beautiful blend of instruments and vocals. I'm just going to have to YouTube that one and figure out who these cowboy junkies are. But uh, that's for whatever reason. I kept thinking about Chris on that one. But uh, thanks, I appreciate it. <laughs> I want to throw a shout out to uh, Scott Sharon. Thanks for sharing that with us on the Facebook page. Uh, let's see. I already made the intros. Uh, what are we drinking tonight? I'm going to start this one off. I'm drinking. I'm actually drinking just a glass of table wine tonight. But it's it's this is a pretty good one. I've been into table wines here lately. Uh, this is from Rag Apple Lassie Vineyards. Uh, in North Carolina, uh, this is one that we came home with uh, from a total wine, or yeah, total wine that we visited out there. This is just a, it's called Rockford Red, uh, and this is really good stuff. So this is just giving me cause to go back to North Carolina and get another bottle. Uh, Jeff, what are you drinking tonight, bud? Actually, I'm teetotaling tonight. I've got, uh, I've got a nice big uh, cup of my the coffee I'm going to use for my coffee mead. It's a, a Caldi's coffee sourced from Timor Leste, which is over by um, Indonesia. Um, really nice. It's it's one of these weird ones where it's, where it's a light roast, which is not typically my thing, but it has a lot of body and a lot of flavor going on with it, so it makes it really enjoyable for me. Is this something that you're tasting for your upcoming uh, coffee experiment? Yeah, well, I, I had a... Um, I, I mixed up some cold brew with a little bit of honey over the weekend after I, I kind of selected some, um, after going around to a couple of different groceries in, the, in town and uh, finding one that suited me. And yeah, I think this is going to pair really nicely with the, the honey flavor. Um, I haven't tried it with any of the, the caramelized honey, but I think this is going to be a real winner for uh, the coffee mead. Yeah, cool. Aaron, what's in the glass tonight, bud? So tonight I've got a glass of mead from a new meadery that recently opened in Valparaiso, Indiana. Name of the meadery is Misbehaven Meads, and this is a bottle of their Down with OB Mead. It's a, a pretty sweet mead made with orange blossom and clover honeys, a traditional, uh, probably on the, the semi-sweet to dessert sweet level, and uh, very nice. Outstanding. Mississippi Chris, I hope you got something better than a Starbucks uh, coffee in your fist. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's better. It's hard to beat. Uh, actually, I'm with Jeff tonight. I'm um, I'm drinking some coffee because, but there's a good reason. Um, you know, you and I we're going to start our coffee experiment here in the next day or so, possibly tomorrow, maybe. Um, and I told you that I was going to do an additional batch brewed a little bit differently. Right. And so I'm actually drinking some of that right now to, to see what sort of tweaks I want to make before I do it tonight. Because I'm going to put everything into cold brew tonight to get ready to brew tomorrow. Right. And um, so I didn't want to... Uh, you know, just uh, jump into it blindly. I wanted to sort of give it a little taste test first and and see if I wanted to do any tweaking. But uh, alongside our, our coffee experiment that we're doing uh, identically, uh, I'm doing a second test batch. Uh, it's going to be kind of interesting, so we'll see how it goes. But this is actually the uh, – this is I'm going to use the uh, – Tanzanian or Tanzanian uh, pea berry for the second batch. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So uh, I really like that one. Uh, I uh, well, well, we'll talk more about the coffee thing here uh, in a little while. Uh, that that'll come later on in the show. But um, right now, I, I kind of wanted to toss this. Uh, you know. And I should start out by saying, uh, you know, this mead making thing is the fun that we get out of it is is 
is being able to do all the experiments. I mean, you know, this coffee thing that we've been talking about now for a couple of weeks, uh, you know, Jeff has had some experiments going. Aaron's got some going as well. And I know Chris has pretty much run the gamut, uh, you know, just playing around with different flavors. And I think that's really – it's really the fun thing about doing this, this whole thing. So – I, you know, we really haven't spent any quality time talking about experiments, uh, you know, how to get them started, uh, how to track them, uh, you know, uh, and whatnot. And I am not a scientist. Uh, you know, it's a hit or a miss for me. I just throw stuff in the bucket, add some yeast, and hope for, hope for the best. Uh, I'm going to throw this over to Jeff and, uh, and and just let him and Aaron take off with this thing. Aaron sent out uh, a really outstanding uh, list of notes here that I'm going to put up on the website a little bit later on uh, about uh, conducting experiments. Um, but uh, Jeff, why don't you head us off in that direction? And, uh, well, sure. Um, then yeah, Aaron's Aaron's uh, overview that he sent was really fantastic. I cannot agree more that everybody should go out to the the website and download that right now. Um, take a take a look and uh, kind of follow along with us once it's up. Um, let me see. As far as experiments go, I've I would say almost all of my brewing has been experimental in some nature or another, just because there's a level of curiosity that accompanies most of what I'm brewing as far as, well, what would this taste like in a meat or what would that taste like in a meat? And that really is kind of the, the main like point of interest for me in, in making meat is trying new things and trying out new things, um, seeing what different flavor combinations work, um, what don't, but still kind of work together. I mean, the, the hibiscus and chamomile, for example, um, was a just a um, the result of a random mixing of some hibiscus meat and some chamomile meat that we made, uh, both of which were pretty good. Neither of which were particularly great. No, it's uh, damn good. And let me let me tell you, I just started making that, and I had some tea. I even dropped some honey in the honey that I'm using to ferment it with. It's it's not just very good; it's damn good. But isn't it fantastic? On. <laughs> the, the two of those flavors together, though, they were like a rock star combination. And, Aren't they? <laughs> you know, I mean, they really work. I think yeah. the only thing I could maybe add to it is, oh, there's there's got to be some way to contrast that just a little bit. And I'm thinking in a future batch, I might try with a little bit of fennel or something nice like that. But again, we're getting back to experiments and trying different combinations. And really, that's the heart of what I do. Um, as, as far as just trying new things and ge- keeping this interesting to me. Uh, now, that said, when I look at trying to differentiate between two factors or two uh, two variables with an experiment, um, I spend a lot of time trying to suss out, even before I get brewing, um, how I can isolate those variables and prevent kind of any variation whatsoever um, in, in – uh, between those variables, you know, for example, I've got this um, five-factor or five uh, five variable nutrient addition experiment that we've been talking about basically since the show started, um, and that like, next weekend we'll actually be doing like a blind taste test on with some of my friends. Um, with that one, one of the things I tried to do was to make sure that the nutrient additions were really the only variable that could be affecting the you know, the flavor, color. Um, Clarity, anything like that that were I, w- I was really concerned with when making these meats. So I went through a lot of making sure that, like for example, all of the um, the fermentation vessels I was using were sanitized the same way. Um, rather than you mixing up five independent little batches of honey, I mixed one single five gallon batch um, and pitched the yeast into that, and then um, decanted that after a really thorough mixing into five different buckets that way, you know, none of them were potentially getting a, uh, a boost over the other that would affect the outcome. Um, and that I think is really important because if you're really considering only one factor or only one point, you really want to make sure that there are no other ways to, um, to influence that. Um, that I think to, to a large extent comes back to my background in cognitive neuroscience. I mean, a lot of the, 
the stuff we did, ex- especially for, like for my thesis experiment, was done um, to control against you know like peer review and things like that. Saying, well, it could have been from this, it could have been from that. No, we we controlled against that. Um, and a good control is important because it lets you say that you know the, the factors that you're actually investigating are what's causing the differences. Um, yeah. That's that's a very sciencey background. Um, tried to distill down to, <laughs> to layman's terms, but yeah, that's that's kind of my overall philosophy when I'm setting up a single factor experiment or even a multi factor experiment. You know, you got to make sure that there are no other points where uh, a difference could arise. Yeah. So, uh, and Aaron, uh, you've got this, you've got this document that you put out, uh, and I, I, I really haven't had an opportunity to sit and really thoroughly review it. I did skim over it. Uh, this is really a good beginning. If you want to start doing mead experiments at home, this is laid out very well. Uh, you know, especially for somebody like me who, you know, I mean, I, I'm not a scientist, so I don't have the first clue. Uh, you know, it's a hit or a miss by just throwing stuff in a bucket and hoping it works. Nine times out of ten, it doesn't work because maybe I went about it the wrong way. But uh, talk about this uh, this document that you put out. I will. And first, I'll just tee this up a little bit. Um, I, I want to just echo a point that Jeff made uh, about his experimental batch and, and identifying the, the hibiscus and chamomile. I mean, I, I think that is definitely one key to a successful experiment is identifying the right factors to include. Um, so, so just hearing you and JD talk about it, it sounds really interesting, but yeah, to tee this up, this um, actually what got me into home brewing was a design of experiments course I took a part of industrial engineering the uh, IE curriculum in school this design of experiments course and my professor was a home beer brewer so for our class project we had to do this experiment and uh, decided to yeah oh. <laughs> It, well, and it, it really was a, a really fun experience. He had me and my, my partner over to his house and um, taught us all about beer brewing and more importantly, um, shared a large amount of really good beer with us. That was really my first exposure to, you know, really quality craft brew and, and just kind of opened my eyes to the world of beer that, that I had been missing. Um, so, so a lot of what I put together in, in this document is based off of the content of that course. And, um, it's some experimental design techniques that are deeply rooted in, you know, in industry, manufacturing, as well as agriculture. And it's these kind of like a family of, ex- of experimental designs that are geared towards testing multiple factors at one time as opposed to taking like a one factor at a time approach. And I'll also preface this by saying that there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing an experiment where you're just manipulating one factor at a time. Um, you know, I, I have talked a little bit about the honey variety experiment that I've been running, which was a one factor experiment. Um, you know, maybe later in, in today's show, when we get to the hopper portion, I'll talk about another experiment I just put together looking at, at three different hop varieties. Um, but there are some advantages to experimenting with more than one factor at a time. Um, so, you know, it allows you to simultaneously study the effect of multiple factors at one time on the mead making process. So, you know, there could definitely be any number so, of factors. So, so factors, um, kind of come in all different shapes and, and, sizes, so to speak. Some are qualitative factors, so things like the honey type, the yeast type, type of nutrient. Other factors might be more quantitative in nature. So what is the fermentation temperature? What's the starting gravity? Or from like a nutrient addition perspective, the the target milligrams of nitrogen per liter. Those are all some examples of, of different types of factors. Yeah. So, so one of the major advantages to conducting a multi-factor experiment is that it allows you to detect interactions between factors. 
Um, so uh, the definition for a two-factor interaction would be the failure of one factor to produce similar results in a response variable at different levels of a, another factor. And basically, the response variable is going to be the, the output of the mead-making process. You know, in, in some cases, the response variables could be quantitative, things like, you know, the, the pH level of, of the must. It could be something like the, the final gravity. But then I think in, in the mead making process, mead is so subjective that it certainly makes sense that, that your response variables could also be qualitative. Things like, you know, the, the taste, flavor, aroma, mouthfeel, color, so on and so forth. Um, so, so again, the advantage of, of multi, multi-factor experiments is it allows you to detect interactions between factors. And, you know, an example of a, a two-factor interaction would be, um, let's say, you, you know, you're doing an experiment with two factors, honey type and yeast type, where with honey, maybe you're experimenting with a wildflower and an orange blossom honey. And then for the yeast, let's just say you're using 71B and D47. Well, what you might detect is a two-factor interaction, which would basically be something like the wildflower honey producing favorable results with one of the yeasts and unfavorable results with the other yeast and, and vice versa type of a thing. So um, there are some advantages to, to doing multi-factor experiments. Well, I, I can see one, you know, um, uh, another advantage for a multi-factor experiment is cost savings too. Because, I mean, why, uh, you know, let's say you're you just using uh, orange blossom honey. You know, instead of burning up, you know, 15 or 20 pounds of orange blossom honey, uh, you know, you can burn up six pounds uh, and do a couple of, uh, of uh, you know, multi-level Factors, right? Multi-factors. Exactly. I mean, if so, let's say you used 15 pounds all of the same honey, and you were just testing the difference in in yeast type. Well, now you've burned through all that honey, and and what have you learned? You've learned what effect the yeast has on your mead. Whereas if you had incorporated a second factor, the honey type, now all of a sudden you've learned about two um, factors. You know. Uh, all, all in the same um, with the same amount of honey. Well, uh, set up an experiment. I've got I've, I've got a bucket load of uh, of wildflower honey here. Set up an experiment that uh, you know with my wildflower that I could run. Uh, you know, a multi multi factor uh, experiment. I mean, what, what would I be looking at? So the the basic type of experiment that I, I wanted to kind of walk through in, in the show tonight is just a basic two-level, what's called a full factorial experiment. These are experiments that are extensively used in industry. Um, I know I've used them professionally before as well as in, in my classwork, and um, I haven't actually used these in mead making, but I definitely think that, that this is a tool that would have a home here. Um, so, to get into just a little bit of the terminology beforehand, um, basically the the way that you would set up one of these experiments is first you would identify the number of factors, and in this case, let's say you know we'll just keep on the same path of two factors being the honey type and the yeast type. Generally, the terminology that gets thrown around here is each factor gets assigned two different factor levels. Um, so one factor level for, for the honey, for example, let's say the low level will assign to wildflower and the high level will assign to orange blossom. And then for the second factor, we'll assign the low level to D47 and the high level to 71B. And um, generally, the, the way that these experiments and I, again, I don't know how good of radio this is going to make for, but um, <laughs> it, the, it's basically N equals 2 to the K. So N would be your total number of experimental runs, and K would be the number of factors. So in this case, with two factors, K would equal 2. 
our number of runs would be n equals two to the two or four experimental runs. And um, basically an experimental run is, you know, the um, every time you execute it, the experiment at a single, you know, the, the factor level combination in which the response variables are measured, that would be like that individual experimental condition would represent one run. So, so this will be like four batches of mead. So the way that, that these are varied, um, and, and we'll post this document out on the website so that, you know, listeners can follow along. But basically, the experiment is organized into a matrix where you have different columns that represent the different factors. And basically, the way that it's alternated would be factor A would alternate from low, high, low, high. And then the second factor would alternate low, low, high, high. Um, so what this would equate to is four different batches. The first one would be wildflower with D47. The second experiment would be, or the exper second run would be orange blossom with D47. The third run would be wildflower with 71B. And then the fourth run would be orange blossom with 71B. And um, without getting you know too too technical here. There's a couple of advantages of this type of experimental design. The the design matrix here has some characteristics. It's called the, the it's balanced and orthogonal, which basically means that the factors in the experiment are not correlated with each other. And that allows you to kind of independently estimate the effects of each of those factors independent of one another. So it's almost like you get that advantage of doing a single factor experiment with with having multiple factors in, in your experiment. So, um, you know, that would kind of be one way to to set up this two to the two full factorial experiment. Yeah, and if you are... If you're as confused as I am about now, <laughs> uh, you really and and this document. If you're down, you're probably downloading this uh, this podcast, and you're listening. Uh, make sure that you download this document that Aaron is talking about because uh, it. You know, just sitting here talking about it, just you know, it's it probably not going to make any sense to you uh, until you can get this document and kind of. You know, go through it and look at it and understand what what Aaron's talking about. I mean, we're we're kind of beyond science 101 here. We're this is like uh, we're now this is like PhD type stuff now. So uh, I, I warned the guys before the show if it starts yeah. to get too nerdy, just reel me back in because I uh, am a self proclaimed uh, DOE stats nerd here. <laughs> Well, you know, I, again, I, mean, I have a PhD. Did I tell you? Yeah, post hole diggers, something or other. <laughs> yeah, some post hole diggers. <laughs> oh. um, well, again, I mean, this, you know, your knowledge of being able to conduct experiments like this is is really quite unique. Uh, I, of course, don't have that knowledge, but now that I have this document, I can understand what you're talking about here. And do my own, uh, you know, to find out, uh, you know, simply, I mean, if the result that I'm looking for is do I prefer 71B or D47, that's kind of what I'm reading here. And if by conducting this experiment, uh, you know, or, or, or doing an experiment, this method, using this method, I could arrive at that and determine whether you know, from now on or with a particular honey that I would prefer one yeast or another, correct? Is that what I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting at here? Absolutely. You'd, you'd be able to see um, which honey you like better. You'd be able to see which yeast you like better. And you'd be able to see if there's any combination of the two factors that, that produces a result that's more favorable than the other. So, for example, well, you, you might find out that 71B works really well with your wildflower, but uh, not so good with the orange blossom. You know, so you, you'd be able to detect things like that as well. Well, and here's the other thing, too, that I'm thinking. And Chris and I had this conversation 
uh, offline uh, over the course of a couple of days, and we were just talking about it, uh, you know, during the pre-show. You know, let's just take the sugar level on honey, for example. The wildflower uh, uh, honey from the East Coast that we're that we're discovering is much more liquid than the honey from the West Coast, and we we have a now, here again, I, you know, neither one of us are experts, but we have a really good logical explanation for that, and it simply has to do with the weather. Uh, so that being said, you know, the wildflower honey from the West Coast is going to be different than the wildflower honey from the East Coast. So that doesn't necessarily mean that, say, 71B is going to produce the best results with wildflower honey. I mean, there's a determination of which honey you're going to use uh, first. So it may be good on my in, in my town, but it may not be so good in Chris's town. You know what I mean? You know, see what I'm getting at? So just because you see something on mm-hmm. on on a website, a recipe, or whatever, and say, "Oh yeah, I use this uh, use this yeast with this honey, great results, good tasting stuff." Here's what it's going to taste like, and you use, uh, you know, if you're in a different part of the country and that yeast doesn't, or that honey doesn't have quite the uh, aromas and characters that it does somewhere else, that may, you know, uh, that yeast may not quite be what you're looking for. Uh, And I, again, again, I'm guessing at all, but I think I'm going down the right road. Absolutely. Yeah, but I think the experiment. I think I think the experiments that you do are relative to you. I think they're significant to you because you most likely are not going to just pull up tomorrow and move across the country. No. So when you do these kinds of experiments, hopefully, uh, you know there may be some slight variations in the honey that you get from one batch to the next, but you're still getting it from the same general location and yeah. in your area. So, uh, yeah, that, that sort of comes down to people online giving advice. Uh, you know, it, it, it's difficult to do. Uh, we, we try to give uh, generalities. And, and you know, I, I gave out this, this general rule that you never use sweet cherries I did that out of my my own experience. Um, that's not to say that someone somewhere can't make an amazing mead with sweet cherries, but I can't. Um, so, uh, you know, these experiments they're they're uh, going to be significant to you and and to people in your area, but they may not be uh, they may not translate well to to someone on the other side of the country or halfway around the world. I guess what I'm saying is you, uh, you know, you, you really need to do your own experiment to get the best results, yeah. get to the results you're looking for. Don't rely Absolutely. on what you might hear, read, or, you know, somebody else that lives somewhere else uh, might tell you. Uh, this is the benefit of being able to conduct these kinds of experiments at home. Well, and if I could air, echo what, uh, what Aaron had said before, there is a level at which, you know, mead making is very subjective. Like, I may like something a little bit on the drier side. Other people may like something a little bit on the sweeter side. Um, your own interpretations, your own, you know, the, the way you find the results of these experiments is going to vary. I mean, Aaron and I could do the same two-factor experiment with yeasts and honeys uh, using exactly the same honeys and exactly the same, you know, batch of yeast. I could like one a lot more than the other, and it all comes down to subjective taste. Yeah. Um, so the people need to experiment for themselves and figure out what they like the best, really. Yeah. And also your ability to perceive, uh, some people will be, a, you know, it, it's a lot like music. Uh, some people have an ability to, to hear bass notes and some can hear treble notes better. Uh, you know, some people have bad hearing all all the way around. That's why you go in some people's house and they've got the TV cranked up to, you know, 40 on the dial and someone else may have it so low you can barely hear it. And it's the same with taste. You know, you, you may not perceive uh, 
what what I consider to be sweet may be way too sweet for you, or it may not be sweet at all. So perception has a lot to do with it. Yeah. Uh, or your ability to perceive. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. So, you know, that's why I sort of, uh, I've always disagreed a little bit with the DJCP guidelines when it comes to what qualifies as a dry, sweet, semi-sweet, uh, going strictly by gravity points. Of course, I do realize that, you know, when you're organizing an event and you're trying to set some guidelines, you have to have something that's written in stone. Uh, something has to be written in stone, and then I understand that. But I also think there should be some some leeway, and maybe there is, uh, because I'm not a real uh, competition-oriented person, but there should be some leeway to be able to taste it and say, I, you know, I don't care what the gravity points are. I think this is fits in the semi-sweet category. Oh, well, then I think um, ask our resident judge. <laughs> you know, I've I've heard this both ways. You know, the I've heard some very good advice though. And realistically, talking about entering competitions and competing in me judging is probably a show in and of itself at some point. Um, but I, I have heard. There are different schools of thought here. There are some people that are very, you know, puristic in this idea that the the significant gravity determines whether it's sweet or dry or whatever. Um, me, I am more of the train of thought, and I've heard a number of even another number of other judges say, you know, if it tastes sweet, enter it as sweet. If it tastes semi sweet, enter it like that. Because if you have something that has a really high gravity but tastes dry, uh, I think we've talked about like a a, a black currant that was an example of that um and it doesn't taste sweet it's not going to be judged very well it yeah exactly and, and you know you that's really a conflict because you can you can make a black currant mead with a insanely high gravity uh that tastes bone dry almost um no i think so, we, you need to pay a little so bit it more comes down to a lot to perception and Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, the what I what I would pay more attention to as far as a finite number result is the strength, um, because they they tend to break this down into like hydromels, um, standard strength or like sack meads. Um, those you really don't have a lot of give and take with. If it's if it if it isn't a strong mead, you shouldn't enter it as a strong mead. If it isn't a light um, like a, a session mead, so to say. Um, you shouldn't enter it as such. You really have to play by the numbers there. But I think as far as sweetness level, you've got a lot of give and take. You really do have to let your own perception and kind of, I, I don't want to say like the, the common perception, but, you know, maybe have a few friends try it and um, get their opinion first before you decide, oh, this is definitely an off sweet or an off dry. Uh, because opinions may vary, but you can generally come to a consensus with a few different people trying it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I guess the advantage. Well, Michael, is, go ahead, JD. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say uh, back to Aaron for a minute. I mean, I mean uh, the big advantage I see here of doing experiments like this, and uh, especially these, these multi-factor experiments. I mean, if you if you have your 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 mindset on doing a large batch, you know, five, six, seven gallon batch or something, and you're not quite sure what the end result is going to be, I can see where this would come into play. I mean, I would rather do something like this first and determine what's going to work best before, you know, because and we've talked about it before on the show. Honey is expensive. I mean, you're paying anywhere from four, five, six, seven dollars a pound, even more in some cases, if you have to order it and have it shipped. By the time it gets to your door, it may be 15 or 20 dollars a pound in some cases. And you know, and if you're lose, if, if you're using twenty, twenty five pounds of honey, that's a lot of money. I mean, Chris has talked about his four hundred dollars. What, what was it, Chris? Your was that your uh, heart of mur- uh, um, heart murmur? The heart murmur. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was in excess of that. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, back uh, then that was after a lot of experiments, also. Yeah. Um, and maybe. But, maybe you know, 
maybe that could have been narrowed down by using something, a guideline, you know, something like this. I don't know. I mean, I have no idea. Well, you know, a technique that I've used uh, to save a little money on experiments, uh, obviously you can't test different varieties of honey uh, using this method. But let's just say, for instance, uh, you're using a tea or herbs, fruit, spices, anything like that. And so let's just say that, that you want to make this need and you don't know how much fruit you're going to need or how much of this particular spice you're going to need. You can set up an experiment where you do everything the same, only rather than using honey, you can use sugar and make a sugar wine. Uh, sure. You know, your, your honey, once you get um, to the stage of actually making your mead, the honey is going to make a little bit of difference, obviously, in body and taste and, and all that kind of thing. But let's just say we're testing this single factor. So we're uh, our big question is how much fruit do I need to add to get where I to where I want to go? You know, so you know it's very easy to make a sugar wine. Uh, save a whole lot of money by buying a five pound bag of sugar rather than a lot of honey. And, and you can narrow down doing it that way. You know, is this too much fruit? Is it not enough? Uh, how's this particular acidity level doing with the sweetness level? And once you get that, that amount determined, then you can move on and maybe do a small batch with some honey and just make sure that the results carry over. Uh, but that's a big money saver when you're starting from scratch on something and you really have no idea how it's going to go. Uh, and you think, well, there may be three, four, five test batches in the future before I get this thing nailed down. Go buy some sugar. It works works really good when, when honey is not one of the test factors. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really interesting idea. I, I like that idea, especially no, if you are going to throw in some some other spices and herbs and fruits. It's a good mm -hmm. way to go. No, a lot of my own test batches have been started with actually uh, just like the big box store honey. Um, Costco has a uh, it's true source verified, so we know it's it's a good. Um, honey, it's not cut with high fructose corn syrup or anything like that, but you can get it for around $3 a pound, which is much cheaper than any other honey you're going to find. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of honey character to it, but if you're just trying a new flavor, like, you know, for example, I just got this hibiscus and I want to try it out. Um, it's a great option because it does give you a little bit of honey character. Uh, it's rather nondescript and not, you know, anything particularly special, but uh, it gives you something that you can base it off of without busting out a, a really expensive varietal honey too yeah yeah and it's also a good way to go if you're uh, if you're wanting to find out the, the true character of other ingredients using a bland honey is a, is a good way to go because you know you don't have any overriding honey coming through right yeah that's true good point uh, Aaron, how are the experiments coming that you have running with the orange blossom and and uh, you've got several varietals I think you've got going there. I do actually. So this past weekend, actually three of the four were clear and, and ready to bottle. So I went ahead and bottled the cranberry blossom, the blueberry blossom, and the sunflower. The raspberry is coming along. Um, it's definitely the slowest to clarify and it wasn't quite where I wanted it yet. So I've, I've left that in the carboy for now. Uh, but, but the other three got bottled and, um, I, I have to say, I, I still am very pleased with, with these bat batches. Again, these are the first ones that I've ever used the, the Tosna method on. Um, they did turn out pretty dry. Uh, I, Actually, I did not measure the gravity at, at bottling, but when I measured the gravity, um, when I racked it from primary to secondary, they were all about like 1.001, so so pretty pretty on the dry side there. Uh, but at the same time, I'm comparing all three of these 
to a dry orange blossom that I did about five or six years ago. And that was still kind of in the dark ages for me before I, you know, knew about things like degassing. Um, I wasn't using Fermaid O at that point. I, I don't even know what nutrient or energizer I, I was using. It was whatever generic brand was available. Um, and just comparing each of these batches to that orange blossom from five or six years ago, it's just striking to me how much better these are. They don't have those, you know, high alcohols, the fusels, um, really pretty smooth tasting. And uh, it, it still is interesting just kind of comparing the, the flavors between them. The cranberry is still very, very tart, um, almost puckery, which is interesting because it was really just the honey that, that was added. Um, I, I would say that it definitely still is the the mead that most closely resembles the um you know the the fruit from the blossom that that it came from um the blueberry one actually kind of snuck up and surprised me a little bit i i have to say when when i had sampled them um at, at the time of racking i was a little bit underwhelmed with the blueberry um i i think i remember it had kind of like a maybe a, a little bit of a peppery flavor, but other than that was, was kind of bland and it's actually picked up a little bit more of a, a tartness over time as well. Um, and the aroma has really come around as well. It, it almost has a little bit of an apple juicy type of smell to it as well now. So, um, that was interesting to see the sunflower. Um, when, when I racked them, that was, Head and Shoulders, my favorite. Uh, and now I don't want to say that I don't like it anymore. I mean, I, I definitely do. And that whatever that flavor was that was in there, it's kind of hard to describe. I, I think I had described it a little bit like an apple juice type of a flavor. It's still there, but it's dulled down a little bit. So I'm um, not quite sure what, what to make of that. But it, it's just interesting to, to see how the flavors change over time. Yeah, it's amazing what time does. I, you know, I go back to the one of, and I, I don't know that I would call us a success, but it was, you know, where I really knew much about making mead. And uh, I put this five gallon batch uh, thinking, okay, I know enough. I can do this. What's, what's the big deal? Uh, it sat here and fermented in the summertime, and I, I'd be willing to bet that the internal fermentation temperature was approaching 80, 85 degrees at least. Uh, oh, yeah, big time. So when it was all done, I could have sold it as lighter fluid. Uh, but I bottled it. Uh, what the hell, you know? I mean, I had, you know, 15, 16 pounds of orange blossom honey in it. It's on a dryer. I was looking for... Uh, like a dry white wine, and uh, I went ahead and bottled it. Well, it's over over a year old now, and it's starting to come around. Uh, and I'm just I'm totally blown away by how much I can even smell the honey in it now. Because when I bottled it, all you could smell was alcohol, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, and I'm really I, I'm really quite surprised. So, uh, yeah, it, it's a uh, you know, it's a testament to time, uh, you know, and these, you know, when you're doing your experiments, I mean, this is another thing, too. And I, you know, there's a couple of meads that, yeah, I probably should have saved or hung on to and just, you know, put it on the back shelf and just let it sit. And uh, I didn't do it. And uh, but I've learned. So, I mean, if you got something sitting there that you're not sure about, just. You know what? Throw a towel around it, put it in a closet, leave it set, check the airlock, uh, you know, every couple of days to make sure it's got water in it, and just leave it set. You know, what the hell? I mean, it's, you know, it's, nothing's going to hurt it. Uh, you might be surprised, you know, six, seven, eight months, a year from now, it may be something completely different. But um, another set of experiments that we got going on here, too, is Jeff. And uh, Jeff has got these. Um, nutrient experiment that he's been working on and that's I, i've really been eager to to hear about that uh where where are we with the with the nutrient experiments jeff well we're we're getting really close to having some um 
some results outside of my own subjective opinions here. Um, they're, let me see. They're, they're very different, which was, again, a surprise to me. They're different colorations as far as uh, saturation level of the, the, the kind of honey uh, color. Some are very light. Some are very dark. Um, now, this is the same honey, same yeast, right? This is, yeah, it was all mixed up into one big five-gallon batch and all just decanted into different things. So right. uh, it should be a good saturation across the board. And it's just very strange to me that they've come out like different coloration levels even. Um, a lot of them are fairly clear. Um, I don't think any of them are completely like uh, transparent at this point, but they're they're getting really nice and um, uh bright looking um we should be having our um our testing party with about i want to say around uh 12 to uh, 15 people will be around to uh give us their opinions on what they think you know each of the the wines taste like and i'm working up a little like essentially a, a simplified uh bjcp um score sheet that we can use for that just for for people that aren't as familiar with the way things are scored and uh, maybe give them some some prompts and kind of like what to look for hints um, as far as you know what do you taste what do you see coloration wise what appeals to you uh, is this good bad or the you know would you would you want to drink more than just this little two ounce sample yeah 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 no kidding that'd be uh, I'd be interested in hearing in fact I wonder. Uh, well, let's, let's talk offline. I got a couple of ideas about that because that's, that's an experience that I'm really interested in. Uh, kind of doing my own thing because I, I've, I've kind of adopted Chris's method of his nutrient thing. Doing the actually, I'm, but I'm, I'm using Fermate O, but I'm doing the I don't know what quasi Tosna thing. It's the uh, you know 24, 48, 72, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is the first time I've done it. I've done doing it on on a couple of different meads I've got going. So uh, I'm curious as to how that's going to pay off because I've been the I've been the uh, the DAP and you know Fermaid K guy uh, up until this point. You know, oh and, sure, uh, staggered nutrient uh, thing. So uh, I'd be curious to uh, you know to hear. Uh, you know, the results of this thing. So, Well, let me reiterate, when I started this experiment, I had very little experiences even staggering my nutrients, let alone, um, you know, using anything uh, approaching, like, Fermate O, Fermate K. I, my, my nutrient addition was kind of like I would pick, you know, the, the yeast energizer, the yeast nutrient from the, the homebrew store and dose it right at the same time I pitched the yeast at whatever the, uh, the label said was like, you know, um, quarter teaspoon per gallon or whatever. And so there is a, there's a level of control going on there with my experiment just to see, you know, yeah. that and compare that to, to these staggered nutrient additions. But I think realistically, even the, um, the degassing process has added a lot to my um, uh, my the quality of the meat, even separate from the the yeast nutrients too. Because um, yeah. I've had major problems with uh, the the carbonation building up and creating a, a carbonic acid, dropping my pH pretty low. Um, so this has been a good solution for me from from that basis alone, let alone from getting good meats out of this. Yeah. Do you have a food saver at home? Yeah, actually I do. I've uh I've kind of retrofit one of my little uh um my uh rubber stoppers with the the little um the wine saver tube uh, yeah. so that I can use that to degas too. There you go. There you go. Works like a chunk. Yeah, and, and for our listeners, let's just reiterate something. Um the the whole staggered nutrient uh, degassing, aeration, temperature control, all of this stuff is what we here at the Mead House consider standard mead making practice. Yeah. Uh, Good point. If, if you ask any of us uh, a 
about making a mead. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of variables with honey and, and fruit and spices and herbs and and all this stuff. But there's an underlying practice that we all have, uh, regardless of which nutrients we use. Uh, you know, there there are these basic standard meat making practices that are just good, solid foundations that everyone needs to do. And, uh, and that's one of them is, is your degassing and, yeah. um, 100%. I would definitely say you don't, yeah, you don't necessarily have to do it, but your mead will be immeasurably better for it. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Spoken yeah. from experience. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and when it comes to nutrients, I mean, I go back to that first batch and, you know, everything I read about mead, after you read enough, you think, okay, I'm the expert now. I thought by just chucking in a handful of raisins, I could call it done on the nutrient. Well, <laughs> yes, again. <laughs> so, yeah, it's know, interesting the- because uh, Jeff's, Jeff's experiment did not have um, what I consider my standard regimen in it. Uh, which is just Sperm AK. Uh, I sort of look at that as my, my basic standard regimen. I follow the table, the, the, the Tosna table to calculate how much I need. Um, I follow the, the same schedule of the additions as Tosna. Basically, I do everything Tosna does except I use Sperm K rather than Sperm O. And, that works for me, and it works for me because I use such high starting gravities. Uh, I have not built up a confidence yet in Fermate O only in the extremely high starting gravities. Not saying it won't work. Uh, I just haven't gotten brave enough to do it because most of my batches are starting out at, you know, six to mm, 15 gallons. So, uh, you know, I told you I have a lot of alcoholic friends. I don't really want to take a. I don't really want to take a risk on a fifteen gallon batch uh, with an experimental uh, nutrient regimen. So, um, you know, especially when you got a starting gravity of eleven sixty two. Uh, yeah, I just, I'm not sure how Fermato is going to handle that. Um, you you throw some yeast into a starting gravity of 11.62, and it's an uphill battle from the get-go. And as much as I'm opposed to using DAP, uh, there have been some occasions when I've put just a small amount of DAP in just to get the yeast, you know, up and awake and and going. So um, we all know there is. We all know Chris is a doctor. I can just see him sitting there over his bucket with a defibrillator getting ready to launch that thing as soon as the yeast die out. <laughs> oh, I'm like, I'm like, a, I'm like, uh, you know, I, I baby my stuff. When I, when I make meat, I, I baby it. And, uh, you know, I think I've said on the show before, I, I look at my yeast sort of as pets. Yeah. And they have to be treated like pets. They have yeah. to be taken care of, and you have to you have to pay attention to what they're doing, and they they sort of let you know what they need. Yeah. And it's a uh, I guess it's an intuitive process, but when you do it long enough, you you so, you tend to develop uh, a feel for for what needs to be done. <laughs> I just another thought just crossed my mind. I just started cracking up. And the reason why Chris isn't with us with the show here tonight, he's at a funeral. His yeast died yesterday, so he's <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's but, been a, there's been a few times I wish they would die and stop fermenting. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I got to throw out another shout out uh, here. Uh, this is going to go out to Bob Stant. And I, I actually, uh, Slans, I got to change my glasses. Let me see. Bob Slans, uh, S L A N Z. Uh, this is on the, uh, the Mead group page. And I think I emailed you about this. Uh, there was a suggestion by Bob that listeners send us their Mead. 
and uh, have us do a live tasting and give you know because none of us, well, with the exception of Jeff, he's now he's now a professional mead uh, judge, but the others uh, we're just average every day we like and what we don't like type of. Uh, uh, it might be interesting to do a live tasting of, of you know, some people's meads if they were to send it. We need to work out some logistics. There's some privacy issues that a few of us have concerned about. Uh, but I mean, what do you guys think about that? Free mead. Why not? Free, yeah, free <laughs> mead. <laughs> Only from an alcoholic, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, I shouldn't have said that. I don't want to get the word out that <laughs> rumors will start. Next thing you know on a Facebook page, Chris is an alcoholic? <laughs> oh, I think uh, I qualify as uh, the farthest thing from an alcoholic. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, you know, we, we used to say we have a, a brewing problem, not a drinking problem. There you go. Uh, but what <laughs> yeah. do you guys think about uh, about Bob's uh, suggestion? You know, to me, it sounds like fun. I mean, uh, we've talked about kind of trading bottles and uh, testing out our own meat. So I see no reason why uh, if our listeners want to send us some meat, we couldn't, you know, say, hey, uh, OK, this this week we'll we'll try uh, we'll try this meat and, you know, give our our thoughts, kind of do a little round table, um, taste it live, so to speak. And, uh, yeah, it could be a good time. I, you know, I think it'd be a lot of fun because, uh, you know, and this is this is mead that's not. I mean, you know, we're not professional meadery judging type people. I mean, with the exception of Jeff and his experience, and uh, you know, him, him becoming a, a a judge, a bona fide judge, I think we're looking at it from a different perspective. I mean, this is average everyday folks like the four of us sitting here uh, tasting other average everyday folks. And, uh, you know, giving us, uh, you know, giving, uh, uh, you know, uh, what we feel about it. Uh, uh, so, I mean, we'll, we'll get together offline, I think, guys. And uh, maybe during our after show little chat that we have, we can, uh, you know, talk for a few minutes on it and, and you know, see where this takes us. But uh, sure appreciate Bob uh, and his idea there at the Mead Group uh, Facebook page. Um, moving right along here, uh, we've got about 30 minutes to go, which I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on the coffee thing. Uh, this is a big project for the four of us. Uh, and, uh, I did get an email from Dan Cross Carey. Uh, I don't know if you guys recall, uh, he's a listener, a fan of the show. And I think I may have forwarded this out to uh, the three of you, but he was talking. Apparently, he's putting a coffee mead together as well, and uh, he had uh, some interesting things that uh, he wanted to bring up. Um, he uh, is doing the cold brewing, and uh, he says uh, it's in secondary. This email came out on the twenty seventh. He says it's in secondary and tasted amazing right out of primary in 20 days going into secondary. Uh, it's been into uh, secondary since April 23rd. Uh, he's going to rack to uh, territory soon and wants to uh, rack onto some oak cubes that he's going to soak in bourbon for a while. Uh, I've never had bourbon in my coffee. That might be an interesting. But he says uh, he would have to disagree with the show on the coffee blend. Uh, he went with a dark roast uh, Sumatran, Chris, and he says he's glad he did because the coffee flavor still comes through. Uh, he thinks uh, if he went with a milder or medium roast, he might have regretted it uh, and uh, thinks it might have taste, uh, might have tasted a little washed out. Um, so he may be on to something. You know, I mean, we had this discussion last week about, you know, and we've been talking about, even offline, about the different roast, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, keep going back to Eric's uh, uh, 
uh, you know, his his uh, his results from his experiments uh, that he's done, uh, and him coming out with you know saying that the medium roast was the way to go, seventeen and a half hours, four ounces, and, and a quart of water, which is kind of the path that Chris and I went down. So I don't know, Chris. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I see another experiment coming along, and uh, this might be right up your alley with what you're doing. Uh, with a little- yeah, you know, uh, well, I would say, Dan, uh, when I think about brewing a cup of coffee, the first thing I think of is a dark roast. Uh, I want a dark Italian, preferably. Uh, a French roast is okay also. Uh, I like strong coffee, uh, smoky uh, I don't really care for sweet undertones in my coffee. Uh, I do drink my coffee with cream. Um, <clears throat> but this is a problem that we talked about already that I, I, J.D. and I both have been wrestling with, is trying to get our heads away from the idea of brewing a good cup of coffee and, and start trying to think about making a coffee mead. And so then you start asking the question, do I want to make this thing all full-blown coffee or do I want some some of the honey character to shine through? Uh, and, you know, it's an experiment just like we've been talking about tonight. Uh, we don't know. We don't know what we're going to come out with. Uh, we have no idea. So you, at some point, you've got to pick a starting point, and this is what we chose. Um, I think in the email, JD, I think Dan also said, uh, he disagreed with, uh, my hot brewing that I was talking about. Yes. Uh, and I, and I guess I should probably clarify that I'm not really hot brewing. I'm, I'm still going to cold brew. This is the second batch that I'm doing aside from our experiment. Um, but it's an alternative method for cold brewing. And basically what you do is you take one-third of your volume of water and you boil it. And you let it come off boil down to about 200 Fahrenheit. And uh, you, you pour that hot water in on the grounds long enough to let them bloom. Um, in other words, you just let the grounds sort of absorb that water. Uh, but really... You follow that up with the other two-thirds of your water that's ice cold, and you do it almost immediately. So it's really not hot brewing. You're just uh, uh, you're blooming the, the the grounds with uh, with your hot water, and then you put the cold water right in on it. Uh, the purpose of that, the benefit to that, is if you have a coffee that's a little bit low in acidity when it's cold brewed normally, uh, that initial hot water will extract some of the acidity that, that straight cold, cold brewing will not. And in this case, this particular coffee that I'm using for the second batch is a very low acid coffee. And when you cold brew it, it's even lower. I mean, it's almost no acid at all. And... I want a little bit of acidity to balance with some sweetness. So I'm, I chose that method, uh, just to bring out a little acidity, yeah. but it's not nearly enough to, to start getting into extracting bitter components and, and undesirable things. So I just wanted to clear that up of how I'm going to do this, this second batch. Yeah, and that's, you know, we we talked about the, you know, the acidity level. I mean, if you pull it all out, uh, uh, you know, we even asked Jeff to, you know, kind of chime in uh, with his, uh, you know, experience in tasting meads. I mean, it's, you know, you, you got to have some acidity in there to uh, to augment the flavors and the taste and everything. So, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, this is this is really, and this is the fun thing about doing this. I mean, gosh, uh, you know, Chris and I are just, I mean, we're coffee fanatics, and I know Jeff and 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 Aaron are coffee drinkers as well. Um, and you know, the, the difficult thing for me is separating myself from that hot cup of coffee I have in the morning from the almost semi-sweet, light flavored coffee mead that I'm going to make, you know, uh, so, 
but hey, you know what? We're going to stay the course and uh, continue on with what we're doing. And from that, I mean, you know, this goes back to Aaron's, uh, uh, you know, his, his uh, experimental, uh, you know, talking about these different factors and, and doing experiments. I mean, uh, be able to determine at the end uh, if we need to do something different. Now, it may be. Uh, it may be that we can go ahead. I mean, with you know, Chris and I like that very dark, roasted, uh, full coffee flavor. It may be that, yeah, we can go to that dark roast Sumatra or, or, or Italian roast, French roast, and, uh, you know, cold brew a good uh, brew and get the appropriate mixture right uh, and really come off with something uh, quite nice. Uh, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the thing about this coffee mead that, that's really intriguing to me is you've got so many aspects to deal with. Uh, you've got bitterness to deal with, along with acidity, along with the tannin levels from the bean, along with the smokiness, the roast level, the, you know, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. <laughs> There's a there's a year's worth of experimentation just making a good coffee made, I think. Yeah. And Chris and I mean Aaron and Jeff have got their own uh variation of this coffee thing going too. So I think we're gonna have some some pretty well rounded experiments going here over the course of the next few months, uh, you know, when this thing uh uh you know, gets going full full steam. So but uh, hey. I want to thank uh, Don Crosscarry for the email. Appreciate your listening. Uh, Aaron, you had something. Actually, that was me. Um, I, I just wanted to interject. I, I think a couple weeks ago we got an email from, and I forget the gentleman's name. Um, he was talking about different sources of spring water, and he had a question for us regarding water hardness. Yeah. Um, I actually did get to do a little research on this, and I checked out uh, one of the two go-to, like, mead brewing books that I recommend. Uh, one of them is The Complete Mead Maker by Steve Piotz, um, who is actually one of the guys that wrote the, the BJCP standards for mead judging, actually. Um, and he has a little bit to say about that, actually. He considers the um, harder waters a, a good source. Um, generally, they, uh, they act as a buffer and prevent uh, the pH drop that we've talked about a few times before. Um in in a lot of cases like that and uh, the only thing he cautions regarding using uh, um, harder waters is in cases like mine it's coming from a tap water source or a, a, a city municipal water source um, a lot of those are are flavored or they're they're um, not flavored uh, they're treated with Artificial chlorine or energy. well they're they're treated with chlorine or chlorinamine um, to to keep the the parasite levels of bay essentially. Um, what and that about, can, what about things like fluorides and I mean, our, our water out here in California is just, I mean, it's got everything in it under the sun. I, I don't know much about the fluorides, but he's, he specifically mentions that, uh, in the fermentation process, chlorines or chlor chloridamines, um, are capable of combining and making some, some really nasty off flavors. Um, this, the suggestion for removing chlorine was actually using a Camden tablet, um, or the I believe it's the is it potassium? Yeah, the Camden uh, tablet removes the chloramine, I believe it is. Well, actually, the the Camden tablet can't always get all the chloramine, chloramine, uh, but it generally gets the chlorine. Um, I forget exactly what he suggested for uh, removing those as far as a chemical source, but the um, the other easily accessible source that he mentioned for getting rid of both was an activated charcoal filter like a Brita. Um, yeah. So in, in my case, we have really ridiculously hard tap water uh, in the Kansas City area um, just due to all the limestone deposits in the ground below us. And I think from here on out, rather than using the generic spring water, I'm going to try some experiments using some, uh, some of my tap water that's been filtered to remove some of that chloramine. Uh, and see if that doesn't give me a better result or at least a little bit more stable fermentation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, I, and there's a way I, I saw uh, someone, and I forgot where I read this, but if you wonder whether you have chlorine or chloramine in your water, if you fill up a white bucket with your tap water uh, under a, a well lit room, uh, look into it, and if it's uh, if it has a bluish tint, it's got chloramine in it. If it has a greenish yellowish tint, it has chlorine in it. Um, I know in some instances there's some municipal water systems that use both. Most of them, as I understand it, will use one or the other. So that's there's a way to tell, and I may have that backwards. You might want to look that up. But Sure. Pretty interesting. Well, and I understand right? the the chloramine is the more popular one these days because it has less of an overt flavor or smell to it that chlorine tends to have. Um, but mm-hmm. it, it's also obviously harder to remove, so it presents its own host of problems there too. That yeah. email uh, actually came from Hudson Parker. Uh, he sent uh, an email back on the on the twenty first of May. So. Um, yeah, you know, the, the water out here, well, I, but here in Southern California, in Los Angeles County, it sucks. It just absolutely sucks. I mean, it doesn't even taste good. Uh, and we use bottled water. Uh, I, I use bottled water to drink, make coffee, cook, everything. Uh, the only thing that we use the tap water for is laundry, <laughs> doing dishes. Um, because the water and I have a Brita uh, and they do work they work really good I have not uh, I just I I don't have the I guess I mean here you know here we go with the experiment again but you know perhaps I should put a a, you know just a short batch a one gallon batch together uh, with the water filtered through my Brita uh, because it's you know it's got the charcoal filter thing in it uh, and see what happens I mean, the water tastes fine to drink. I drink that water all the time. I've always got a pitcher in the refrigerator. So, but just tap water, you know, unless, and I, I guess the true test is if you drink your tap water and it tastes really good, then I guess it's okay, huh? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm a, I'm a very proactive person in almost all areas of my life. But in meat making, I tend to be reactive. Yeah. And, you know, in in choosing water, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. If it tastes good, that's what I use. Yeah. And nine times out of ten, I use Ozarka uh, spring water that's bottled. Uh, I think it's available just about everywhere. I don't think it's a regional thing here. Um but I, I tend to use bottled spring water. I don't use distilled water. Um, but no, and you're not supposed to use distilled water for some reason. I don't remember. Yeah, because it's it's lacking in the in the minerals, and yeah. and the same thing is going with you know the benefits of the harder water. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm sort of reactive on things like that. If it tastes good, I use it. If I don't like to drink it by itself, I'm not going to put it in a mead. Um, things don't improve when you make mead or when you make wine or beer. Uh, you know, you're not going to take uh, several bad tasting things and put them together and they suddenly taste good. Uh, the the mead is only going to be as good as the worst ingredient yeah that's true and so uh if all your ingredients taste good then then you have potential to make a good mead so you know you gotta you don't want your water to be your limiting factor yeah you guys know as, as i'm just listening to the conversation here I can't help but but think so my parents are actually getting ready to retire next month in, in June, and uh, they're moving up to a, a mountain cabin in Clayton, Georgia. So it's um, a little south of the, the Smoky Mountains there. And when we go to visit them, one of the things that I, I really look forward to, I mean, yeah, it's nice to see the folks, but the w- tap water that they have there, I think it, it's off of a well, 
I mean, it's just the most phenomenal tasting water. And I know it sounds silly because it's just, you know, just water, but oh my gosh, is it good? And um, I'm thinking I'm going to have to fill up a jug of that and bring it back for some mead making after the conversation tonight. Yeah, there you go. You know, I remember, uh, you know, like you, you just talking about, I just brought back a memory I had of, you know, with, with my dad, we went up to Alaska, uh, and, uh, we wound up on the Mendenhall Glacier up there and, uh, we were drinking, uh, glacier water that was actually hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years old. Uh, and my God, that was the best tasting water. Oh man. Uh, and I haven't tasted anything like it since, but uh, good mountain water. If you made mead with 100,000-year-old water, you wouldn't have to let it age at all. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Get my hands on some of that water. But, uh, you know, good mountain water. I mean, you know, on my days in Colorado, we had good water out there. It would have made fantastic mead, too. But, uh, yeah. Um, and thanks, uh, thanks Hudson Parker uh, for that email. I hope we, uh, I hope we were able to explain, uh, uh, explain ourselves, ourselves to you there uh, about the water hardness and what have you. Um, let's see, we're about twenty after the hour here, so uh, we pretty much talked the coffee thing to death here for at least tonight. Uh, I have made my cold brew, so it's in the refrigerator, Chris, uh, ready to go. I'm going to fire off tomorrow. Um, I wanted to hear what Jeff and Aaron came up with for their yeah. experiment, if you could. Yeah, have you guys finalized your uh, your coffee deal, guys? I have, yeah. I, I think Aaron has as well, have you? So I have everything except for the beans still. And, um, you know, Jeff, I, I know we had tossed around some ideas for, for a while there. We were thinking about trying to use the same bean as one another. Uh, then uh, for the sake of experimentation, I, I think um, we, we've also thought about using different beans. And initially, I think we were both leaning more towards a lighter bean Interestingly, before the show tonight and just in the last couple of days, I've started to, to kind of rethink that a little bit and, and thought it might be interesting to use a darker roast because, you know, it sounds like the three, everyone else on the show, the three of you guys are all planning on doing a lighter roast. So um, that is on the docket for, for this weekend to, to go pick out the bean and um, – if, if time permits, get that, that brewed up as well. But, um, other than that, I think, you know, we, we had talked about doing, um, the same starting gravity, I believe of, of 1.130. And we also, uh, Jeff had the idea of caramelizing, uh, only half of the honey. Um, and Jeff, do you want to maybe explain a little bit about what, what your thought process was behind that idea? Well, sure. I, Part of the, the reason for uh, only caramelizing about half of the honey uh, was to let some of that varietal honey character or some of that honey character um, continue to shine through. I mean, we, we didn't want anything that would overpower the, the coffee flavor itself uh, because the very strong burnt or roast flavors um, in the honey could definitely do that. Um, but we definitely wanted something that would complement the honey as far as a roasty character. So the notion I had, and I've, I've heard some people on different meat groups and uh, posts on Facebook talking about when they make a boche, they caramelize only part of the honey. I thought that might be an interesting way to try it so that we could still get some, some raw honey and some caramelized honey and get uh, a little bit of both uh, worlds, if you will. Uh, and my, my notion was to caramelize probably about half, maybe a third. Um, I, I think I'm estimating I'm going to put three to three and a half pounds somewhere in there to get that right gravity in there. So I'm going to start with a pound and a half of honey and caramelize that um, and then make up the difference with non-caramelized honey. Sounds like a plan. Yeah, I think you're going to be, uh, uh, to get 11.30 in a gallon, you're probably going to be over three pounds for sure. I was I was kind of guesstimating about three and a half, but I mean, you know, it yeah. depends on so many different factors. 
So you like we've already caramelize. Uh, you're you're going to caramelize a specific amount and then use the rest to bring it to the gravity that you're looking for. Then because it Correct. may be three and a half, it might be three and three quarters. I mean, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll dial it in with some raw honey just so I don't have to to yeah. caramelize an extra like. You know, eighth of a pound of honey to make up the difference and make it exactly half and half. Yeah, and uh, you know that kind of leads me into my next little comment here about hydrometers. And uh, I think uh, I think uh, maybe every show, every other show or so, uh, you know, we want to talk about some specific pieces of equipment that almost kind of a must-have uh, that you have uh, should have in your mead-making toolbox. And I just wanted to start off tonight by talking about the hydrometer. You know, so many recipes, uh, there's so many great recipes that you find out there that really sound good, but they're lacking in a lot of pertinent information that you really need to be successful because we've already established that honeys, whether it's wildflower or orange blossom, can differ from one coast to the other, even in sugar content. So, you know, when when one recipe talks about, uh, you know, just put three and a half pounds of orange blossom honey in, well... You know the content of the sugar may make up a may make a difference on whether that meat turns out to be sweet or semi sweet, uh, depending on how much you use. So, and this is where the hydrometer comes in. I quit. I, I don't even bother measuring anymore. Uh, I know about how much honey I need to dump in to get started. Uh, and from there on out, uh, when I, if I'm doing a five gallon batch, I bring it up to four gallons and I get within range, uh, of my, uh, where I want my gravity to start. And that from there on out, uh, it's just a matter of adding honey, water, honey, water till I get to, to five, five and a half gallons, uh, and the correct, uh, hydrometer reading. So if you don't have one, I mean, you know, for less than 20 bucks, uh, you know, a decent hydrometer, it's almost one of those must-have. Uh, how, how do you guys feel about it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree. We, uh, J.D. and I, uh, J.D. texted me, and he said he was putting his sourwood together. Uh, I sent him some sourwood honey a while back. And uh, we were discussing yeast, and I I suggested he use D21. So uh, he said, D21 it is. And I did a quick calculation on the mead calculator, and, and uh, you know, this this is the gravity you want to start at. And he said, okay, I'll do that. So a few minutes later, it happened to cross my mind that this is uh, 16% yeast, and I'm used to using 14% yeast. So I quickly texted him back. I said, hold on just a minute before you pitch. we got to kick that gravity up. And I went to the meat calculator, and when I typed it in, I figured he would need an additional three pounds of honey. Uh, in reality, it took almost six pounds to get to the gravity. So if we had been going on measurements alone, he would have been way off if he had not had a hydrometer. Yep. So, um, you know, and that not only demonstrates the importance of the hydrometer, it also demonstrates how very different honeys can be from different locations. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. No, realistically, the same honey from the same beekeeper from the same hives can differ year to year. So yeah. unless you have something that can be precise like a hydrometer or a um, we could also mention it's a little bit more expensive, but there is also a refractometer, which I got from my brother-in-law this past Christmas. Um, either way, you need to be able to, to measure that pretty precisely to get a good result. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree you know, totally. Uh, like I said, I mean, Absolutely. less than uh, less than twenty bucks is probably the first best investment you could possibly make. Uh, you know, if you're going to start making mead and, uh, you know, uh, throughout the next, uh, you know, uh, weeks, throughout the next shows, future shows, we'll talk about pieces of equipment that we have that we feel are important to, uh, making pretty good mead here, whether we do one a week or one every other week. Uh, uh, but we'll certainly have an offline talk about it and set something up. Um, 
the next uh, next thing I want to talk about here, just just real briefly, uh, I'm rather proud of myself, guys. <laughs> and I know you've seen the pictures. I have me a kick-ass little brew mead making station. Uh, I put pictures up on the Facebook page, and I wanted to just uh, briefly describe how I did it and what I used. Uh, this is a relatively inexpensive uh, little unit, and it's made up of furniture that you can buy from Ikea. And uh, it's just simply three of the Calax 57-inch shelf units, one 30-inch uh, Calax shelf unit. And they're arranged so that I've got the two tall ones uh, on the side, uh, the little short one in the middle, and then uh, the other tall one is uh, goes across the top from one of, you know, side to side from, you know, the two side ones. So, uh, and it's just tall. Oh, and then I have a, uh, I've got a 30-inch Meltorp tabletop uh, that I put on top of the 30-inch cabinet. So, that's my that's my workbench, my working surface, and the two fermenters. Um, I've got two of the uh, SS Brutec uh, stainless steel seven gallon fermenters. They sit nicely on top uh, with my uh, ice chest full of uh, ice water down below, uh, and it's all nicely uh, arranged. Uh, you know, so that uh, it's well organized. I've got plenty of shelf space. I can store bottles, all my uh, yeast, nutrient, uh, and and equipment, hydrometers, that kind of thing. And uh, it's very simple. I mean, it took me probably all of maybe a couple hours to assemble and put all. Uh, and I think it it was less than by about two hundred and fifty dollars, two hundred fifty five dollars. Something like that. So I'll, uh, I know that I put it on the Facebook page. Uh, I'm working on a post for the website and I'll have some pictures and I'll go in a little bit more detail about how to put this thing together. But, uh, you know, for less than $250, $260, you can put yourself together if, you know, a nice little brew station that's pretty functional. And uh, I just thought I'd uh, throw that out there, and uh, you know, if anybody is interested. Oh, I am absolutely envious of your brew station. I wish I had the dedicated space for one of my own. Um, having seen that, I mean, we are we're brewing out of my kitchen counter space and um, things like that here at home, and just kind of I have a um, a spare refrigerator in my utility room that I'm using as a fermentation chamber while I'm working on retrofitting it with a, uh, a temperature controller here. There you go. So yeah, it's a, your, your setup is fantastic. I'm really, really envious of it. <laughs> Agreed. I, I just pulled up some pictures right now and uh, that, that's a pretty killer setup you got there, JD. Yeah. And you know, again, it's a, uh, it's a DIY thing that, uh, you know, we like to talk about here on the meat house radio show podcast show. Uh, you know, things that work for us. And I'm a huge DIY fan. Uh, you know, I know we talked about my chilling system. Uh, we'll probably do that again on a, on a future show as well, kind of reiterate that. Uh, and, uh, you know, put the plans back up on the, uh, on the website again, or at least, uh, you know, make it pop up uh, near the top. But, um, yeah, we need to get those those cooler plans up for sure. Those, that's uh, that's quite possibly the biggest advancement that that new mead makers could could make in their mead making is temperature yeah. control, and uh, and you get to use uh, you might even get to use duct tape, which is even better. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, anything you can do, you know, duct tape is like the force. It has a light side and a dark side, and it. Binds the universe together. So <laughs> there you go. Well, and you also mentioned a, a, a pump system that you had set up uh, at some point or another. I'm excited to hear more about myself. I've, I've been looking at doing something like that for some of my brewing too. Here, you know, uh, you know, maybe on the next show or two, uh, you know, we can go over that. I'll uh, get a little bit more detailed plans together and. Uh, 
uh, you know, put it in the show notes. But uh, absolutely, like Chris was saying, I mean, one of the, one of the huge things that I learned early on uh, after several failed experiments is temperature control. I mean, and I would almost go, I would almost venture to say that nine times out of ten, at least that often, okay, the reason why your mead probably didn't turn out the way you expected is probably because of temperature control, if no other reason. So, uh, yeah, I, I have said over and over again, and I'll, I'll say it again. I did not start making good mead until I got control of my temperatures. Yep. And that was the single missing factor to my making good mead. Yeah. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up for another Tuesday night here at the Mead House. So, uh, guys, I guess we'll get together again next Tuesday night, and uh, I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about then. So Let's 9 o'clock, 9 o'clock p.m. next Tuesday night, we'll see you right here at the Mead House. 